Welcome everyone to the Roadmap to Growth webinar. We are going to be talking today specifically about how can you use data to fuel some of your growth objectives and help you to um, tell your story right to retailers or investor partners in order to fuel some of that growth. I'm Kelsey Michelle, and I am one of the product leaders at Nielsen IQ, specifically for the Bizer platform. If you haven't heard of Bizer, it is a platform specifically built for small and emerging brands to take advantage of the same quality of data, but in ways that are easier to digest and at price points and packaging offerings that are what you need um, to take advantage of data. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so the industry today, where are we? The CPG industry is $1.2 trillion in sales, and there's makes up over 140,000 brands. So it's huge. And we see a lot of changes occurring right now. I don't think I can look at a different news source without seeing something about inflation or supply chain issues. But we also know consumers are more educated and health conscious than ever before. That doesn't mean everyone is only purchasing gluten-free, but what we do know is customers are searching based on product needs or attributes or environmental concerns that are important to them. And having transparency into these items is gonna continue to be important for consumers moving forward. And what we see differentiated in the brands that are really succeeding is those that can be nimble and meet those consumer needs or are appealing to those consumer um, attributes that they're looking for. And so emerging brands have really dominated over the last couple of years in fueling a lot of this growth in the industry. And what we want to do here today is talk about how you can be one of those brands as we look at a similar study right in five years. How are you one of the brands that have gained national distribution or have expanded to more categories and how can data be part of your journey in order to accelerate that growth. But we know um, in the past, data has seemed somewhat unaccessible for a lot of reasons. Um, we surveyed and 40% of um, survey respondents said that they use data for RGM or revenue growth management, which is specifically around pricing and promotion optimization activities, for example. Um, but that leaves 53% that aren't using data for some of those tactics today. And why? The number one we hear is it's expensive. 33% of respondents said that they don't use data today for RGM activities because of a price barrier. And with Pfizer, we've specifically launched um, different packaging options and configurations that allow you to unlock price points that meet your needs, starting at just a few reports a year, all the way up to full subscriptions. The second we hear is it's really hard and time consuming. Um, 30% of respondents said that it was too time consuming to unlock meaningful insights out of the data. So we've launched templated visualizations that take this data and make it more digestible for you. So you can spend more time with your sales force, optimizing your business and actually taking advantage of the data rather than just trying to figure out what do these facts mean. And then the third is it's too hard to get out insights that are actually meaningful. So 25% of respondents said they would need to purchase data, but then also purchase a tool on top of that data to actually extract anything that's meaningful. So what we wanted to do is put more of the work on the tools in order to unlock the data, have you take advantage of it, understand what to do with the insights through things like uh, smart ranks, recommendations embedded in the reports. And that's some of the things we're going to show you examples of here today um, as we walk through a couple examples of how can you start off as an emerging company and taking advantage of data. But before we launch into that, um, we're actually going to bring up a poll to understand what has your journey to date been with data um, so we can tailor the rest of the conversation as we go through some examples. 
So as you'll see the poll pop up on your screen, um, if you wanna go ahead and answer how you've accessed data, um, we'll look at those results and then continue on. So just a little bit more about what's coming after the poll. So we're gonna walk through some examples of how companies in your position can start to use data and what are some things that you should focus on and then launch into spe three specific tactics to take and the specific um, reports that you can use as examples. So taking it all the way from high level to very actionable. And then at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to get started with using the data and what can you do as a next step. So Anna, if we're getting some of those polls back, you can go ahead and start to uh, show the re results. All right, we have the poll coming up in just a second. All right, thank you. So <clears throat> let's see, top response here, we see 48% um, of you today already have access to ongoing data, which is great. So we can focus a lot on how do you take advantage of that data you're already purchasing and what should you focus on in those retailer conversations to help your growth um, path. And then 29% say you re rely on free data, research, or some of your internal measures. So this will be some good examples of if you start do start to purchase data ongoing, what are some of the things that you can start to look um, towards in order to take advantage of the data you would have access to? So thanks, everyone. All right, we're going to continue on and start to go through some of our examples. So launching is a brand isn't easy, as all of you know, that's why you're here. Um, but staying on shelf can just be just as hard. So using data for both of those pieces, right? How do I get on shelf and how do I stay there is really how do you fuel your online growth? So first, you need to have a product that is meeting and expanding consumer product need. So what is the growth of your category? And who are your consumers? And what is that or what is that competitive segment look like? And what's the growth of those brands in this competitive segment? And it seems like most people are using data in some way, shape, or form today, but just taking a step back, right? Nielsen IQ gets all of the scanned data from the retailers, and then we categorize that data into segments like a category. Um, and so, for example, in sparkling water, you're going to have the top line, what is growth of sparkling water? But then also, who are the competitors in sparkling water? So you can watch for emerging brands and also quantify the growth of your competitors to understand the true landscape of what you're up against. The second is who are your shoppers? So in addition to capturing sales information from the retailers, Nielsen IQ also has a panelist of shoppers who report what they're purchasing. And we also know a lot of information about those panelists, such as their demographics. So when you go to look at a category, sparkling water or your specific brand, you can understand the demographics of that shopper base but also look at some really important measures such as loyalty or penetration or how many shoppers are repeating purchases. All to, under, to quantify, right, what is the consumer that you're attracting and how is that differentiated in terms of um, getting them to come back and repeat and grow the category overall. And then the third thing that we're gonna focus on is reaching your customers where they're shopping or getting on shelf. And there's two pieces of this, right? It's how do I get distribution in terms of acquiring new stores and new retailers um, and also expanding in terms of your distribution where the retailers are sold today, but also the productivity of what's happening when you are on shelf. So measures like velocity measure your sales 
per point of distribution and allows you to look at your performance overall. And we're gonna be digging a lot more into velocity as we get into some of the specific examples. So just to recap this, um, we have what, right? What is the product segment you're in? What is the performance of you and your competitors within it? The who, what is the differentiated consumer base um, that you're attracting? And then also how are those um, shoppers purchasing your products or your category? And then third is where are your products being sold? How are you performing where you're sold? And what are your opportunities to expand into new distribution um, as well? And those three components really come together to tell your overall product growth story. So at a high level, sounds great conceptually, but let's talk about this very tactically. I think the biggest question I get from brands is I need to understand more clearly where do I start with using data, right? You know, you've either heard you should use data from investors or your retailers, or you've seen it used by other brands in the past, but you need specific examples of where do I start today to make an impact with these measures. So that's what we're gonna focus on right now. So the what, um, the what example we're gonna go through is specifically looking at how do you use characteristics or product attribution to segment your category and tell a more attractive growth story. So it's great to say sales are growing at X, but if you can segment your market down even further to show even more growth, right, of the specific consumer segment you're attracting, that's gonna be advantageous for your overall story to either an investor or a retailer partner. The second is shopper, a shopper perspective, and we're gonna focus specifically on loyalty um, and dive into what does brand loyalty mean and how do you quantify it and use that also to help fuel your overall story. And then the last is velocity or that sales per distribution point, which equivalizes performance regardless of how many stores that you're sold in. So you can help to yourself get on shelf at more retailers. So we're gonna move over from talking about PowerPoint slides into actual live reports with data, um, because I think it's always better than just showing the slides to actually show, right? When I'm talking to brands on you know, what they need and um, specific examples, like this is the same thing that we're looking at to drive their performance. So this first report that we're gonna look at um, dissects the category of cereal overall. And just a, a side story, I was, um, we're gonna be looking at Purely Elizabeth, um, which is a gluten-free granola company, um, which I purchased this weekend and was delicious. So it inspired this uh, example that we're gonna be walking through in these three reports. So it's a really good example because they're in a niche segment, gluten-free granola, but are part of a much larger category that is a very big legacy category of cereal that's very well established. This is the most common case I see in brands that I'm talking to, right, of emerging brands are in a very established consumer segment, but are trying to carve out a new definition of it or a new niche area, or there's a consumer need that's popped up and they're trying to revolutionize the category. So cereal overall in this top measure here is $8.6 billion in sales, huge and is growing um, at just under a percent. So modest growth, but understandable given it's such a big, well-established category. So when you look at the top line numbers for cereal, and if you were to just start there, yes, it's big, that's great from an investor perspective. For example, they really wanna see that there's um, space for you to grow into. So being part of a big category is very attractive. But modest growth isn't always the best story here. 
when we start to dissect what's making up the category overall on this bottom left donut chart, you'll see 25% is ready to eat kids cereal, another 25% is ready to eat adult cereal, and then we have family cereal making up the last kind of 70% of the cereal category. But as you get into the next few segments, um, these next three are all gluten-free. Um, so we have gluten-free kids, uh, family, and adult cereal making up another about 15% of the category, um, which is great. And you can also see this on the, the right side here. Sorry, about 25% of the category. And we can see the gluten-free families at 1.1 billion, but simply, purely Elizabeth actually falls into this gluten-free ready-to-eat adult cereal category, which is growing at 18%. So this changes your story a lot that you're going to go to either investors or retailers with and say, yes, we're part of very big category of cereal, but we are in the top growing product segment of ready to eat adult cereal. And as a side note here too, right? If they're looking to expand their portfolio of products, you know, kids and family, same space, also growing really strong, might be some very easy line extensions for them to consider too. So that's our first example, your growth story, telling that growth number, but really using those attributes. In this case, we just looked at subcategory, but you can things look, look at things like um, gluten-free, um, if you wanted to pull that out, packaging um, things, environmental claims, sustainability labels, in addition to just different product segmentations. Uh, the second thing we're gonna take a look at is loyalty. So this is again looking at the cereal category overall, and here we now see purely Elizabeth on this first line. Um, shopper loyalty, and specifically the brand shoppers that are loyal to the brand, that's the percent of shoppers who have purchased the brand that have spent 65% or more of their spend on that brand. So that means the majority of what they're spending is specifically related to that brand. So here, 25% um, of purely Elizabeth shoppers are loyal to their brand. When you look at something like Cheerios, interestingly, I wasn't necessarily expecting this, um, but Cheerios actually has a pretty loyal brand following as well. Um, but as we start to get down into some of the other examples, so Special K, for instance, only 21%, 22%. So even though this brand is much smaller, it actually outranks um, many of these other brands that are the top selling brands in overall cereal in terms of loyalty. Why is this important? The more loyal your brand following is, right, the better your sales will be. But also retailers know that if they have uh, brands with a high brand loyalty, those customers are going to come back. And that's going to drive the overall performance of the retailers' categories because they have the brands that are most important and have the most loyalty in them um, for their shopper base. So this becomes really important when you're talking to the retailers. The, the third piece, and diving in a little bit deeper into that a retailer story and how do you talk to the retailers? So brand loyalty is a really important component of it. But also retailers want to understand the KPIs. So a retailer category manager or buyer that you're going to be working with is going to be focused on how do they grow their category overall by having the best assortment possible. And so they're going to be looking at key performance measures about the different brands in order to optimize that portfolio with the intention of growing their category. And so you'll see in this, this is just a simple brand ranking report that's available in Visor, and there's tons of different measures in here. We're going to go through a couple of them. 
Um, but you'll see this sales rank here is just your typical dollar sales rank. Purely Elizabeth is ranked number 37. Um, but we also have this rank at the beginning. And this is actually a composite rank of the most important measures in showing emerging brands and overall brand success. So it looks at yes, dollar sales, but also dollar growth, um, TDP, which is the total distribution points, distribution growth, and then velocity. And so you can see purely Elizabeth, while only ranked 37 in terms of true dollar sales, is ranked number 23 because it's outperforming on some of those additional measures. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So the dollar sales growth here is 21% versus the overall category growth was just under 1% at 0.9. So outperforming the category in terms of total gro dollar growth. You can also see the majority of that is driven purely by unit growth. That's another really great thing to highlight, especially to investors, that your, most of your growth is being fueled by true unit growth and not just pricing right now. And then switching to the end here, we have the distribution and velocity measures. So distribution growth is 16%, meaning you're gaining more shelf space overall of the market. Also a really great measure to show you're an emerging brand. And then lastly, we have velocity, which is the sales per distribution point. And a distribution um, takes into consideration here both your breadth, so how, how much of the market you're covering in terms of ACV measurement, but also the depth, the number of items that you're covering as well. And so um, here, for example, just before I switch into the report, we're gonna go through an example of velocity and a little bit more on what it is. But here you can see, right, that rank is really showing that this brand is growing substantially, growing in distribution, growing in sales, has a strong velocity. It's um, ranked better than I think the 24th item. I'll scroll down for a second. Um, so the 24th ranked item here, right, has a lower velocity. So when you start to talk to a retailer, how you would use that brand ranking in a velocity is to say, here's my growth and my velocity is ranked better than, let's say the 24th brand that you're carrying. And so by carrying my product versus this other product you're already carrying, which has a lower velocity, my products are going to do better um, and help to grow the category overall. So diving into that velocity a little bit more, we have an example here that we're gonna walk through. So brand A, is $2 million in sales with 8% growth, which seems pretty strong. Brand B, however, has $3 million with a 14% growth, which seems stronger. But there's some contextual information that's missing here. So for brand A, we it's um, $2 million in sales, but that's only made up of two items in 5% of the market where brand B is five items and 12% of the market. So brand B is offered across more of the market and has more items. What this means is brand A, well actually less in terms of true dollar sales, has a four time higher velocity because it's sold in a more limited set of the market. And this is why velocity is such an important measure for emerging brands because it truly takes into consideration like, what is your performance in each instance where you're selling right product in the market. Um, and so you can say, right, your product is doing better even than some of uh, the brands that are selling in terms of more true dollar sales, but because that might be driven just because they have wider distribution. We can automate a lot of these insights that are done. So one of the things we highlighted at the beginning, right, is time savings is so important and being able to extract insights out of data is imperative to even using data. 
So we've also launched a solution called My Stories, which takes a lot of what we walk through. So general performance and growth story, how you're performing versus your competitors, how your what are your KPIs across your shopper bases, and what are your item opportunities, and puts it into a presentation that automatically is created based on the product segment and the market that you select. So if you're interested more in stories, um, really, or any other features, feel free to ask any questions. I should have plugged that at the beginning. We'll take questions towards the end. So if you have any questions on anything I've said so far, or anything we'd like you to like us to follow up with you on, feel free to add it to the questions. Um, or we're going to talk a little bit next on, on where do you go from here? So where do you get started? So we saw some people are using some of the free data available. And if you haven't taken advantage of that, through the Bizer platform, we offer a free subscription, which gets you access to three free reports um, that looks at things like brand and category sales. Um, what are some of the performance measures for your top competitors? and what's your velocity. Specifically, this category and brand trend report, if you haven't signed up for the free subscription yet, um, takes a look at your uh, top line sales and growth, the category top line sales and growth, your velocity and velocity growth, and then the category velocity and velocity growth. So kind of distilling a lot of those key measures we have talked about into one report. Um, so scan this QR code to sign up for free, or there's also the option to request more information as well if you have questions on any of the features that we shared or how to take advantage of some of the information available to you. So I really appreciate your time in joining. We're going to open it up um, for a few questions. I think we have two minutes left, so maybe we can get in a couple of questions, Ayana. Okay, cool. So yeah, as the first question, um, set of questions come through, we did have one come through, Kelsey. So the first one that we have is, do I have to provide any credit card information for the free access or does billing trigger after a certain time? No. So there is no credit card information required. There are no um, no kind of triggered billing terms that occur. You just get the three refor reports after signing up um, and accepting the terms and conditions. So it's a, a pretty quick process to get access to those no strings attached. Okay, cool. And then we have another question. It says, just wondering why you focused on adult cereal versus granola for purely Elizabeth. You could do either. So you, for this example, I decided to just kind of go overall cereal to show kind of the breadth of some of the examples, but you certainly also could have dove into just the gr granola segment as well. So it was really just the sake of this example and showing the gluten-free and kind of the gluten-free story as that's really important right now versus just looking at granola. Okay, thank you for those. So the next one is, what does Bizer cost? The, the benefit of Bizer is we've launched a lot of flexible packaging options. So if you just have an ad hoc data need or just need monthly reporting, we have solutions for that. Um, but we also can grow with you, right, on your growth journey and your data journey to all the way up to big unlimited packages as well. You know, kind of our middle tier packages start at a couple thousand dollars a month, but we have price points a lot higher and a lot lower than that as well. Okay, cool. And then the next one, it says, inflation is a big concern. What type of insights can you provide on pricing and any price change recommendations? Yep, we hear this one a lot. Um, Pricing is top of mind for everyone right now. So within the Bizer platform, we have pricing reports which look at things like what are your prices for your competitors? And then as you get into some of the analytic offerings, um, we have reports that include elasticities that help you understand how price sensitive are 
your items to price changes. So if you're being forced to make a price increase due to a cost pressure, you can understand, right, is there an expected impact in your sales due to um, the price change you intend to make and how big is that going to be, right? Is it is your price relatively inelastic or your item relatively inelastic and therefore as you raise price, there won't be much of an impact. So you can go ahead and make that price change. Or are your prices very price sensitive and either you want to wait and follow the market when they make a price change um, or potentially consider some other tactics to offset that price change like promotions or a line extension or new product launch. Okay, perfect. The next question is, I currently have a buy subscription. What is a good cadence slash the correct amount of reports to run to maximize their subscription? It's a good question. I get asked um, quite a bit and it, it depends on which subscription you have. Um, but what I would recommend is that it's scheduling either a data on demand run or, you know, looking at kind of a common business measurement report that you want to look at on a monthly basis that kind of helps you track what you're doing overall and then use the alerts on a weekly basis to really go through those common um, kpi measurements so my favorite alert is the growth alert um, that just helps you to keep track of what's your growth what's the growth in your category overall um, and those are automatically sent to your email on a weekly basis, so you don't need to do anything. So if you have the alerts weekly, your kind of standard business report, either through the distribution landscape or a scheduled data on demand run, that monthly kind of covers your overall performance. And then really honing in on um, diving deeper for those retailer conversations, whether it's a line review or a broader, um, category management review and either using the stories or a couple of the reports in order to do that. Okay, perfect. So that's all of the questions that we have right now. Perfect. And I think we're over time. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, and we look forward to continuing this series and doing more of these webinars in the future. Thank you.